Association and media and now we're being recorded. So that's wonderful for prosperity. And um, so uh, we have a gallery space on the Lower East Side. We have, we are a membership organization for us, right? For, uh, to give them uh, access to professional practice and exhibition opportunities. It's been in operation continuously since 1947. So we were doing emerging before the word was even invented. Uh, it had a gallery space on the uh, West Village spine on 10th Street, back when it first opened in the 50s. Uh, and it moved to uh, Soho in the 80s, had a space on Broom Street. They like Broom Street. And then when the Lower East Side sort of got hopping as a merchant art district, um, Equity Gallery moved there. So we're on, still on Broom Street on the East Side. And we've been in that space for seven years. Um, and we're doing knock on for Micah. We're, we've made it through the pandemic, but well, most of it and still doing well. I invite you all to go look at uh, Equity Gallery at our website. It has great benefits and opportunities um, for exhibition opportunities and allied practice. So um, right about a year before COVID hit, we had decided to rebuild the website, very luckily, um, just so we could open access and give more to artists exhibit project pieces, whatever. Um, and then when COVID hit, we were kind of ready to go, right? We already had sort of done six months of shows from our members um, to, in our project spaces, which we call East and West Wing, which is sort of cheeky. Uh, just again to give artists opportunities to exhibit. And Alicia and John uh, presented an opportunity to do prints, which we were really happy about. Um, so I'm going to segue and introduce them. And they're going to tell you a little bit more about that project and what its aims were. And then they're going to introduce the artists um, that they curated into that project. And then those artists are going to talk a little bit about their work. We're also lucky to have uh, Mac Holbert here tonight, and he's going to be our moderator. And uh, Mac's going to tell you all about himself, but he's a real pioneer in digital imaging and digital production and multiples in the digital space. Probably one of the first dudes to get to that space. Uh, and he has a lot of great questions prepared for our panel. So we're going to explore this idea about what it means to have prints and multiples in the digital space, how that authorship and all how that makes work accessible uh, to a greater public which is actually one of equity's main missions right to sort of get art to people in an affordable economical collectors of work so uh, that's my song and dance uh, i love equity gallery i love working with artists uh, alicia and john have been amazing we just give them a snap for all the hard work they did to make this uh uh, both this event happened and the show happened. It's a gorgeous show. Everything I just said is loaded in the chat. And you can, uh, the links are there to go see the show uh, and the little bit bios on the artists that are present. Uh, you can also load your questions into the chat as we progress. And at the end of the evening, we'll have some time to read those questions aloud and ask any of the panelists that would want to address them. Okay, so Alicia and John, it's all yours. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, so, John, do you want to start or do you want me to? <laughs> well, I, yeah, I, I guess I can jump in. So we, Alicia and I had been trying to figure out sort of how to navigate the outbreak early on, just in terms of correspondence between the two of us as we, you know, had gone to graduate school together and have known each other for a good 15, 16 yeah. years now. So uh, within that, we she, Alicia had participated in one of Equity's uh, brick and mortar exhibitions and pitched the idea of putting together a, a proposal for the show. And that was sort of the incubator for this where we came up with an idea, well, geez, we're struggling with, with how to present work between the two of us. How do we sort of broaden that view and bring in other artists to maybe put together a proposal that includes an approach to, to something maybe a, maybe a solution to that. Yeah, yeah. that sounds right. Um, you know, one of the things that John and I talked about a lot was how we both are very um, grounded in the physical acts of making our work as well as 
the presentation and the experience. And, and it was really hard for us to show new work, even if it made it into a gallery in person, you know, with so few people able to go to them. And that struggle to try to capture anything that's close to the likeness of an actual painting when maybe it's four or five feet large and you know at best you're going to be seen on a 19 inch screen but mostly 12 to 3 inch screen and so we were just kind of thinking about like how how do you adjust your own practice to that and this idea of making art that's meant to be in the digital space as opposed to this accommodation to what's happening um, just became really intriguing and uh and then John, you kind of came around to, you know, that it could all be people who are painters, um, whose main practice is grounded in that. And um, so it would bring a certain aesthetic and um, a kind of point of view for um, leaping into this. And I think what I really enjoyed about the show was just how every artist really approached it differently. And, um, and how each of us came up, you know, our practices are different, but, you know, each set of art, like, came to this issue from a different vantage point. Um, so I'm going to pull the show up just to scroll through it. And John, if you wanted to say anything, you know, we'll just do this quickly and I'll screen share um, so we can move on to talking to the individual artists. Me. Yeah, I don't want to give too much away about the, um, I'd like the <laughs> artists to speak for themselves, for yes. sure. Um, but yeah, like Alicia said, we we approach this from the sense of what's the phenomenological experience of mm -hmm. viewing art, you know, and what is that in a physical setting versus a, a digital one. And so to physically have a painting in front of you is so dramatically different than having a, a screen in front of you. and. You know, so much art viewing is done on screens nowadays, but you know, it, it's not necessarily, you know, what I wanted to get at was the idea of how is that, how do you migrate that experience, you know, and what does it really mean for people who specialize in painting and sort of live and breathe in painting to create work that's purely digital. And I think the artists in this show stepped up and made some really exceptional work for this exhibition. And I think, you know, it's, it's made for a really interesting sort of shift in perspective on, on how we work. Yeah, and it was, um, you know, it was really fun also just to play, you know, as the curators to play with everybody's art. You know, we received these files and then John and I created this um, image for the tops and we could only have one. We agreed we wanted to have everyone represented. So, um, and I think it was also important to make this space the gallery. You know, it wasn't meant to be just, we're throwing some images online um, because we can't show them where we would have wanted. So it was, um, yeah, set up beautifully by equity and, um, and I think enhanced in a lot of ways um, with the work we did with the Thousand Museums, who is, you know, offering prints, then we can talk about that more. But yeah, I like the, just the way it, it is its own space. Well, and just to, to backpedal a little bit in terms of like what, what crossed my mind with this show really early on, and these were some ideas that have been percolating in my head for years. Um, you know, I used to, God, <laughs> I'm dating myself here a little bit, but when I was in an undergrad, the internet was becoming a big thing for, you know, showing art and viewing art. It wasn't it, that you could exactly see much, but um, there were things that were out there. So there was the ability to sort of look at and grab images. And so fast forward 20 years, um, Stephen Main had produced a series of digital works that he had specifically posted onto social media. And I was really enthralled with these works and thought they were really exciting. And I asked him if he had any, you know, opposition to me downloading those works, just pulling them from social media and, 
you know, maybe tinkering around with them on on the printers that I have at my day job. And Stephen was I said, "Don't you dare! Me, Don't you <laughs> dare!" <me> <laughs> So he said, don't you dare. And I took all of the yeah, manuals. Anyway. I think I've got a total. Of... <laughs> I think it's some 60 some odd images that he posted and, and I had accumulated. And a few, I out a few of these on this fabulously printer through uh, my day job. And it occurred to me that that would be something that could be kind of interesting to be able to have work that's out there, not necessarily just in the social media realm, but uh, specifically in a gallery where we're going somewhere to look at work and to experience work and what would it mean to make that more accessible to the viewer to be able to let them have a way to take that home so that the experience isn't trapped on their screen or you know on their computer as as a file but it actually can become something tangible and so that's that's how we found ourselves leaning into <laughs> different options uh, with this exhibition, and especially as, as a way to produce a product to accompany the files. And so looking into that particular issue, we landed on a thousand museums and that was where we all of a sudden realized we had this whole world of options in terms of producing work that could be printed at any number of different sizes. And although we chose to stick with one particular type of paper, for the prints in this exhibition, there's a whole realm of papers that can be used. There's framing options. So for each for each size, you could get a different frame. For each frame, you could get different papers. It was just, it all of a sudden became this like, wow, holy shit, there's a whole marketplace out there that we hadn't even really thought about in terms of, of art making. I know so much of my personal time in the studio uh, is spent obsessing over these individual objects. And so, to think of them as multiples or as something that can be reproduced indefinitely with a few tweaks, you know, not unlike the t-shirts that you can get online that you get whatever design you'd like printed on whatever color and you can try it out on different models before you get it and what it's going to look like. And it, it's a little tongue in cheek, but it also I think is, you know, speaks to a larger sort of realm of possibilities that we have now that we didn't necessarily have 15 years ago. Yes, all that. <laughs> and so with, with that being said, I think this is probably a good opportunity to get some, you know, to hear from the artists in the show. So I think we'd like to start with Amy. Hi, I was muted. <laughs> um, let me get my screen. Okay, you can all see that, right? Okay, so I'm Amy Bensel. I live in Las Cruces, New Mexico. I'm primarily a painter. Um, and actually living in the desert during the pandemic last year kind of led me to making the pieces for the show because obviously when everything is shut down, my only contact with the outside world was social media. <laughs> so I was posting a lot more on Instagram and Facebook. Um, but it's really hard to show um, the materiality of my paintings and how the different textures and genes, you know, work in each painting. Um, so I find myself taking a lot of detail shots and posting those to try to explain what's happening in the paintings. Um, so when John and Alicia approached me about the show, I started to look how I was using the detail shots and it opened up a whole new way of thinking about them as standalone works. Um, and all these detail pictures share the same DNA as my paintings, but they work as separate compositions. Um, and as I manipulated the shots, I really liked how I could change the colors and try different filters to create something that doesn't exist as a physical object. Um, and some of the works are based on paintings I don't even have anymore. So this is the only way I could access that work and use it going forward. So to show a little bit of the process of how I, I came up with these, um, I have some images of how Fidneck came to be. That's the piece up in the upper left. 
And so that's based on a painting called Rensk. So there it is. It's how it's finished, how it exists in real life. Um, so as I'm working on a painting, I take a lot of process photos. Uh, so here's a little peek behind the curtain, <laughs> if you will. Um, so I rarely show these uh, in process, um, just because I feel like it's like raw ingredients that aren't really baked. <laughs> um, so I often work on one side of the painting um, and finish that side before I figure out what the visual response would be on the other side. So in this photo, you can see the left side's finished and that's how it's gonna look when it's done, but the right side kind of hasn't even been begun. Um, and so I rarely post pictures like this because people invariably think it's finished and tell me what I should do next or tell me to leave it as it is. Like everyone has an opinion, so I tend not to show it. Um, and since it takes so long for me to finish a painting, uh, I tend to take a lot of the detail images just so I have something to post as I'm working on it. So here's some of the shots that I had from when I was working on that painting at that stage. Um, so I move it to different orientations, um, you know, zoom in, find different details to show. Uh, and so that's how it looks when I post it on Instagram from that painting. Um, and so after I worked on the show, here's how the colors changed. Um, and the composition is much simpler and more graphic than the physical painting. Um, and normally I make up words to use those titles, but since the pieces in this show are digital knockoffs of my own paintings, I, I found some names online that I could use. Um, because I was doing so much shopping online last year, there's all these retailers I found that have pretty wacky names that are ripping off products and just selling them on Amazon. So I started keeping a list of those retailers and I chose names for the pieces in this show based on that. And this one's called Thin Neck. And if you look them up, they have these uh, nylon hammocks that they sell on Amazon, which I thought was kind of fitting because there's a little bit of a, a dip in this piece. Um, so I'd say that working on the show gave me lots of ideas for possible projects I could do in the future, but I need a developer who's way more computer proficient than I am to bring them to fruition. Um, but the process definitely got me thinking about what can happen with a piece after I'm finished painting it. Like it's not just a physical object, but it has a life after that and ways I can continue using imagery of paintings that are older that I don't even have anymore. So I think there's a lot of possibilities and I hadn't really considered before. So yeah. On to the next. Thank you so much, Amy. Thanks, Amy. Um, <clears throat> Our idea was to go in alphabetical. So next up is going to be Alicia. Hello. Um, so I had not made digital art as my art practice before this. Um, I mostly use Photoshop to create renderings or to um, draw out uh, forms that I'm going to pull up my screen now are uh, I think that's it. Uh, forms that become these panels that I've been working on. So I mostly paint on wood and I use the wood grain as part of an element within the painting. And I was doing a show where I wanted to um, have multiples, but I was also thinking about how to break apart a space and um, how to create a single painting that also read as multiple parts. Um, so with this one, I had um, a fabricator do uh, CNC routing for a piece of wood, but it was meant to show it could connect back, but not really perfectly. And so a lot of my art is about motion and how um, the way we see the world, we will connect things that aren't actually connected or, you know, make up that space in between um, or see motion as something that is still like we're seeing the world in photographs a lot of the time. And so just using Photoshop to draw these shapes so that my can take them 
and um, cut them out on the machine. So I, at the same time, I was using a lot of um, other ideas around multiples. And so this was another series that I made last year. And the idea was everything has some common elements and it can read together as in painting. So you get these lines that flip and yet all of the colors are different as the sort of primary um, color that's in the each painting. And the, there were two shapes. So there were 47 of these paintings that all went together and there was a six by 12 and six by six. And so as I was making these was when COVID hit and the show that I was making them for, we ended up having the show, but it um, you know, didn't get a lot of viewers. And I, um, you know, I still, this is still one of my favorite pictures, which was actually in my studio because of it being on the two walls. So one of the more important aspects of my paintings are the edges and the way that things will flow over the edge and wrap around and, and with these actually connect from one to the other, sometimes by rolling off an edge. And so I was really struggling to photograph these and actually capture that. Um, so some of these ended up being in the show at Equity Gallery. And here you can see, um, you know, just how hard that can be to really show, you know, those sort of dynamic connections. And, um, and actually this photograph was part of what it led to, for me anyway, the conversation with John about like, I don't really know what to make at this point because it is so hard to, to photograph, especially when you're doing multiple and you can't really zoom in on a single part. So once I started working on the digital imagery um, the, the first thing I did was just play with older pieces that I made and I ended up using it to create almost everything that's in the show. And so I was cutting up this painting, um, taking lines and colors off of it, and then putting it onto this page that, you know, it's a Photoshop page. They're easy to create these gradations. And, and I really liked having, you know, this light and dark and, um, you know, the way that an image could or a form could cross over and read so differently from one space to the other. So the painting that I was cutting up was this one. And it's one that I had finished in the early spring and I knew I wasn't going to get to show it or I, well, I did for four days and then I shipped it off to the person who had commissioned it. And so this is pretty typical of my work. Um, you know, this kind of flowing, moving ribbons of color and so using that as a type of map and something to help um, give some boundaries to where the, the colors will end up. Um, and But a lot of this paint is also reflective and metallic. And, and so again, um, I was really interested in trying to figure out how to make something that would translate better to the internet. And of course, you also get the, um, yeah. You lose like these edges if you don't see it in person. And those were really important to the work as it was in the show. Um, sorry, it's called a complex set of affairs. And so this piece is, if you go back to the first one, which is called, it is a collective flourishing. You can actually see almost all of these elements. Actually, I think I did not delete a single one from this one. Every single element that's in this painting, you will find in this one. They have just been stretched and warped and manipulated and sometimes moved, but mostly pulled and, and um, 
maybe the opacity changed and clearly the background color changed. And so it became a really interesting experiment to think about how, like, what are the simplest things you can do to change the condition and what are, and so it was just, it was a lot of fun for me to sort of get into this kind of world building space. Um, and the more you zoom in, like there's still all of this stuff happening and it, you know, at a certain point pixelates. And that's also something that I thought was really fun and exciting. And so I would play with putting these really intense colors. And that's why I like the idea of the different sizes of prints. Um, you know, I, I want to, I might end up ordering this one really large just to see, um, what it looks like because there's this experience of saying, here's the screen. And then for those who are interested, knowing if they zoom in, they're going to keep finding something and access of even better. Um, so this is you from the show and it's called um, was I decided to start cropping. And so I focused on this part here. And you can see it as this much larger main element. And then this piece I pulled out and then I started recreating and copying it. And, um, and so I was also thinking about these ideas of how nature reproduces and um, you know, sort of sends its seeds or spores out and they turn into copies of themselves, but sometimes they change and sometimes um, their environment affects their growth. And yeah, it was, um, it was an interesting way for me to work because as a painter, I do a lot of planning and I will often um, stare at just the panel for days before I make a decision on the first line. And then everything after that is a reaction to that line and then the next one and then the next one. And working digitally, I could do that, but I also ended up just going and going and going. And then if I went to a direction that, eh, don't love that so much, could back up. And then you've always got the original file. And so I ended up making I think 20 pieces for the show and then having to pick um, because it, yeah it felt like there weren't any boundaries and and that was kind of exciting for me and that's here I'll stop screen sharing all right thank, thank you, you. yeah beautiful <laughs> okay that means I'm up next uh, bear with me you guys so uh, Similar to Alicia, I had I had started with a series of, of works that were really kind of strange before the before the outbreak shut everything down. They were pieces that were going to be on clear PVC, and I had this sort of random idea of oh maybe I can do something cool like uh, you know build a light box for them or something. But that that hasn't manifested yet, and this is just an example of what one of those looks like in process. Um, you can't see any of the transparency, which is great. That's fine. Um, this doesn't relate to that, so we'll go back for a second. Um, so basically, with 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 the works for this exhibition, I approached it similar to to both Amy and Alicia in the sense that I had all these random process shots, and I had some things that I was tinkering around with, and just trying to find a way to move forward uh, in a world where people weren't necessarily going to be looking at physical objects in person. How did I want to make something that could, you know, tangentially be part of that bigger process of, of my art making? And so I took those process shots that we're looking at here and also took some finished shots of other works like this one here. And let's see if we can find it. one more. Oh, yeah, and this is a good one, too. So this is just to kind of give you a, a sort of a taste of what gets combined into what ultimately became. Let me see if I can bring this up again. Here we go. I want to, let's see, I don't want to stop screen sharing. I want to share a different screen. 
So bear with me again, and then we'll pick apart one of the pieces. We'll actually pick apart um, a version of Learning to Kiss. So this wasn't even the final version that came out. Um, ooh, and I can't tweak it. What? Ah, bummer. I'm totally showing my inability to, to manage things. But here we go. All right, now it's working. So this particular layer corresponds to one of those process shots. And what I found myself doing was reassembling these things um, in a manner not too dissimilar to how my paintings are made. Uh, so for my process, basically there's a couple of layers of color applied with one type of tool. And then uh, I use a, a different type of tool to apply these sort of curvilinear marks or waveforms onto the piece. And I think about these in terms of uh, in terms of technology and static, like I'm, I know I'm dating myself a little bit here, but the uh, like the static we used to get on old cathode ray TVs, um, <laughs> kind of you know sparkle and flash and shimmer all over the surface. Now, if your if your TV goes on the fritz, it typically just turns into a bunch of squares, which is intriguing in its own right, but not so easily made with uh, with some of these tools. And so using that curvilinear form on top of these color options can be a bit time consuming and tedious. And I don't know why it never occurred to me to do more of this stuff digitally, but you know, it takes what it takes. So here I am uh, sort of at a point where I had these works assembled from sort of the existing bits and pieces of other paintings. And a lot of what I consider as being important to the work that I make in the studio you can kind of see behind me how this piece has a really huge hot spot on it from the lights I have above me in the studio. That's because it's got a really heavy layer of varnish on that I applied at the end. It adds a bit of depth and uh, a layer of like sensuality to it that it doesn't have beforehand. Um, all the colors that are in it, the magenta, the green, the yellow that are, that are parts of the layers, you know, really get a depth that doesn't exist uh, prior to having the varnish on them. What I found when I engaged with the digital work was that, you know, I could get something similar because instead of working with subtractive light as I do with physical objects, I'm working with additive light. These things are having all the colors come together in the form of a screen, like a real screen. So it was a little bit of, of, di of a different thinking process, but provided some I think comparable experiences in viewing the work. Um, and, you know, it really, really opened the door for a lot of means of integrating parts of my process that I haven't thought about before. Uh, I have this tape left over. You can kind of see bits of that hanging on the wall here. Those look great in reproduction, but they're that big. You know, I can make these collages, I can do some sort of like fun stuff with them, but I really wanted to try to translate that experience into something larger. And I found myself thinking about that, you know, sort of whole array of different experiences, whether it was the translucent PVC pieces, the varnish on these sort of traditional paintings that I make, or even the collage aspect of assembling the tape back into these different pieces, all of that fed into the process that I used for making these works for uh, for equivalence, you know, and just to kind of touch on what that title meant to me, you know, I was creating these works that were digital and I wanted to try and find some sort of equivalent in the digital realm to the physical works that I was making in my studio. And as we sort of went through this process, there was even, you know, the step farther, which is what's going to be the equivalent on the other side. You know, how do you, how do you get from the digital back into the physical. And that's where we landed on doing the printing. And so the prints are really exciting because like Alicia said, you can get them done at, at some pretty large sizes. And I hadn't thought all that much about it as a, as a processes until the job that I have now working in des a design studio where I see these guys make these things that they're staring at on their screens all day long and then they print them large. And it occurred to me that there was this whole realm of possibilities I hadn't been allowing myself to explore in terms of 
work that was constrained by the size of the tools that I'm using. And when I allowed myself to think of the computer as another tool or as the printer as another tool, you know, that opened up a, a set of doors that I hadn't really allowed myself to, um, to really explore before. So um, on that note though, I'll go ahead and wrap up and pass on to John, you're gonna be next. So I'll let you take it away. Uh, perhaps I can get uh, Alicia to pull up uh, the images from the, the site. I'm just sure. going to talk about those. Okay. Uh, yes. And I just want to say that, uh, yeah, and, and go to the one, uh, the next, keep going. The one with the blue, yeah, right there. Yeah, I really want to talk. Uh, start with that piece and talk about that. Uh, I was traditionally trained to be a painter uh, when I was in school, in college many years ago, and I was living in New York in the early 80s. Uh, but in the 90s, as soon as I was able to get a computer, I got a Mac in the late 90s and began to see the possibilities of incorporating digital with analog. And I work in a space in between both of those because I also make uh, oil enamel paintings on large sheets of honeycomb core aluminum. And that's what I'm sort of known for. But uh, I guess in the past 10 years, I've been working with this process where I print one image on top of another over and over again, usually anywhere from three to five images all printed on top of each other. Uh, and in this particular painting, there's a point where I stop after maybe two printings and that blue area over, that's a head, a woman's face that was doing a performance in my loft. Uh, I took a photograph of her and, and after I printed some glitches on top of her, face image, I, the blue you see is, is spray paint out of a can. So it's one of, it was another layer and then I re-photographed it and then printed on top of it some more. Uh, in fact, I have another version of this very piece where there's three, uh, two other colors on top of this particular piece. And when I reach an endpoint, I usually output these on a really large scale. I did a show uh, six or eight months ago where some of them were outputted onto canvas uh, eight and at eight feet by six feet. Uh, and when I go to the printer that I work with, we repeat the same process that I do in my studio with the smaller ones where I physically put the image back in the printer and print another image on top of it. And this uh, print shop here in Dallas has one of these billboard size UV ink printers and they allow me to work with them where we put the canvas back in the printer and print over it repeatedly. And so the ink actually builds up on the surface and it becomes something different than if I were to have flattened the image of Photoshop and just did one print on a large scale. I, we run it through the printer. Sometimes it's purely an abstracted glitch image that I've totally disrupted. And so, What's tricky is what is the uh, sequence of the images that come up? This is another 